drops. But in an instant, the skies grew dark and storm clouds rolled in. Thunderous rains poured down, giving way to the floods that began to carry my loved ones away. Your tide swept over my community like black across the midnight sky. And when morning came, my neighbors were few. Your waters, they wreaked havoc. Your violent floods have left nothing but destruction and massive casualties in its wake. Those faces and the voices that I once knew, gone, are the comfort of the place I still call home. Your currents carried away people who became family and replaced them with unfamiliar faces who look at me as though I'm the stranger, as though I am the one out of place to call home. Your uncaring, callous, and colonizing rivers took what we fought for. Land you deemed to be unfit because it housed darker skin, you now claim by authority of capitalism. Your waters are no more cleaner than our polluted oceans. And they do not wash away the cries of those that you sent downstream and far, far away. You came in slow, like rain on a lazy afternoon. And my God, I wish we had noticed the drops. Thank you. Mm. So, hello everyone. My name, again, is Tamika Bennett, and I'm the director of Youth United for Community Action in East Palo Alto. Anybody know where East Palo Alto is? I hope to God some people do. Just by, oh, thank God, okay. All right, you will be very surprised at how often people look at me with a very blank stare on their face because they know Palo Alto, but no one knows East Palo Alto, which is just right over the ramp on the other side of 101, right next to Ikea. That's how everybody identifies us, Ikea. Um, Youth United for Community Action is a, a nonprofit, and we are in our 25th year now. I'm very excited to say that because no one thought that a nonprofit run by young people would last past its infancy stages. But now we're one of the longest standing um, organizations in East Palo Alto, and we've done a whole a hell of a lot of work to ensure social justice in our community and in communities like East Palo Alto around the Bay Area. Um, and I wanted to just stop for a second and say thank you. I'm not sure who organized it. I'm going to assume it's the folks who have TED Talk on their shirts. Um, I just want to say thank you all. I can't, this light is like blinding, so I can't see you. But thank you <laughs> so much for the invitation to come and talk with you all today about something that is really important to me, uh, and that's housing, affordable housing, and how it's under attack and threat uh, by gentrification. So the poem that I wrote and just did for you seconds ago uh, is about gentrification. Uh, I likened it to water because if anyone knows East Palo Alto, half of my community is, what's, is in what's in, I'm sorry, half of my community is in what's called a flood plain. That means that when it rains very heavily, uh, we're flooded. So a lot of our apartment buildings, um, a lot of our homes that are owned by seniors, they're flooded every few years and it's just, it's a mess. And it's such um, a contradiction because water is supposed to be life-giving, water is supposed to be this wonderful thing. And in my community we have this very interesting relationship with water. And um, I likened it to gentrification because when I look up the definition of gentrification in Merriam-Webster, it's really interesting. It makes gentrification seem like it's supposed to be this really wonderful thing that comes in 
and cleans up a community and makes it so much better than it was before. But the part of the definition that they're missing is the violence that is part of gentrification in its nature. It uproots people who have been living in communities their entire lives and places you somewhere else that is extremely unfamiliar. And if you are fortunate enough to continue living there, you're now seen as this stranger and this person who doesn't belong because you're a remnant of what used to be. Um, East Palo Alto is, I mean, it's just, I, I love, I loved growing up in East Palo Alto. I loved growing up in my community. We're really tiny. I mean, we are really small. You can walk the length of my community probably in about half an hour from 101 all the way down to Dumbarton Bridge. That is, that's it. It's not much. Um, and so growing up in somewhere that's so small, it was awesome. I knew everybody. I might not have known your name, but I knew your face and I would wave hello. You know, it was just, it was really tiny. It almost felt kind of like a family reunion, like every day. I, I, I just saw everyone. Um, it took 20 years for East Palo Alto to even come into existence and become a city, right? My elders fought year after year after year and battled in Superior Court just to be called and recognized as a legitimate city. And um, that type of history Right? There is a huge and great sense of cultural and historical pride that is just instilled in you as you grow up in the community. And, and I love it. Right? It's just, it's who we are. And um, uh, one of my favorite memories of growing up in East Palo Alto in this small town is of my neighbors. Right? Um, I had a neighbor, his name was Casto. And Castro had lived next to me for as long as I can remember. Like, I don't remember him not ever being there. I think he was there when I was born. Um, not in the hospital room, but living next door. And so um, I was probably like in the 11th grade, 10th grade. I'm a lot older than I look. Um, I was probably in about 11th grade, and I'd just gotten my first job. I was working at some data polling company uh, in downtown Palo Alto. And uh, I had to take the bus home at nighttime, and it got pretty dark, and uh, I had to walk about six or seven blocks to get home, no biggie. But every single night, Casa would wait out, make sure that I passed his house, and got into mine. And he just wanted to make sure that I was okay, make sure that I was safe. Right? People like Casto, that's who make up East Palo Alto. Right? It's so much more than just a zip code. East Palo Alto is more than a bunch of buildings and soil and cement and dirt. It's home. It's community. And when things like gentrification happen and take place, it violently ruptures everything that we know to be normal. Right? And it flips our world completely upside down. Um, the phenomenon of gentrification is currently happening at a rapid pace in East Palo Alto. At first it was like this slow trickle of unfamiliar faces that, you know, we didn't know. And then all of a sudden, within the span of maybe a couple of years, so many people who had made, community, uh, made East Palo Alto what it is were gone and had left and were moved out to places like Modesto and Tracy and Stockton, but we're still coming back down this way just to work, right? Because the Bay Area, Silicon Valley is where all the jobs are. And um, the poem I wrote and that I, I performed a little while ago, it just, I wanted to offer a different side of gentrification, a different side from what Marion Webster says about it, a different side from what our president says about it and humanize the stories that come out of it. Right? These aren't just poor people who can't afford to live in their homes anymore. These people fought for 20 years to incorporate a city so that they could call it their own. 
East Palo Alto was brought into existence because of racial banking practices called redlining, right? Banks wouldn't lend to uh, black families who were coming into anywhere else, not Palo Alto, not Menlo Park, Woodside, Los Altos, you name it. They made sure that black families only were able to buy homes in East Palo Alto. And when those families began settling into the community, uh, realtors did something called block busting. So they would take buses of black families who were excited to be moving into their new homes and they would drive them through the community. And all white homeowners would see this bus full of these black families. Realtors would scare them into selling their homes. And thus you have today a very um, segregated community, right? East Palo Alto on one side of 101 and Palo Alto on the other side. And through all of that, right? Through all of that, you would think that we were sad and just, well, we're gonna take our lot and that's it. No, my ancestors and my elders, they fought. They said, that's fine. If this is the land you wanna give us, we're gonna make it ours. We're gonna make it awesome. And we're gonna make it a home. And we did that. East Palo Alto sits smack dab in the middle of Silicon Valley. We are like right near a bridge. When y'all are hot over here in Mountain View and Palo Alto, we got a breeze because we're next to the bay, right? It's just, it's nice, it's wonderful and we love it. We've got Cooley Landing so you can take a nice walk out by the trail. It's our home, right? We built it, we fought and we, we, we made it what it is today. And all of a sudden, because of greed and capitalism, people want it back. They want to take what we fought for, they want to take what we did, and they want to turn it into money, profits, and all these other things. That's a whole other lecture I will not give today. But um, I want to make sure that as we're talking about finding our ex today, that we are humanizing what's happening all around the Bay Area. East Palo Alto isn't the only community in danger of gentrification right now. It's happening everywhere we look. And your theme struck me as so interesting. Um, I really wanted to be like creative and come up with this like awesome catchphrase or whatnot, like ooh, X marks the spot or something. And I couldn't do it. I'm not that snazzy or whatever. But um, I think my brain also might just work a little bit different because I don't see X as something that's missing in this grand equation for how we solve the housing problem here in the Bay Area. I actually see X as a factor and a drive that's going to propel you forward to make change and become a change maker where you are. My ex is gonna be very different from my sisters or my brothers. Your ex is gonna be different from the person that you're sitting next to, right? My drive is a sincere love of people and a deep belief in human dignity and decency when it comes to housing and who can afford it. Um, that is what drives me to rally in the streets. That is what drives me to fight back against an oppressive regime named Trump and the administration, that is what drives me to make change. And I'm not just talking about picking up trash off the street, though I'm not knocking that, that's important. I'm talking about taking up arms, not guns, taking up arms in terms of policy and laws and entering into some of those areas where real power is held and making change on behalf of and in support of those who might not be able to speak up for themselves. I'm talking about taking up arms and making sure that no one who lives in the Bay Area, California, or the world feels like an outsider because they can't afford $2,500 a month for a studio apartment. Decency and dignity, that's my ex. And I'm hoping that you will find yours and use it to propel yourself forward and make change at the risk of sounding extremely cheesy. X is Y-O-U. Cheesy, I know, but it's true. Thank you. <laughs>